if we only teach the students the curriculum, we have failed them. This is a quote from my book, The Innovator's Mindset. And when I was talking to my guest today, Ryan Kelleher, the author of The Superstar Curriculum, we really started talking about the characteristics and the things that we need to develop in our students that go beyond the curriculum. And I'm not saying don't teach the curriculum. I think the curriculum is a minimum. We can actually go above and beyond it. But are we actually working with our kids to get really good at school or to really get good at, or to become good at learning, to become good at life? Because I think a lot of our students, when they walk out, they understand the things that they can do to get good marks, get good grades. But do we develop them as learners? Do we develop resiliency in our students that we understand that there's always going to be failures that come along our, to our, our way? How do we teach kids to get back up, go through that process? And it, when I was talking to Ryan, it was really interesting hearing about his journey uh, in his work, teaching an entrepreneurship class, uh, some of the things that he had learned along the way to get to that point, and really kind of talking about how are we developing students in this process to not only actually better their lives, but better the lives of others. It was a really great conversation. We talk a lot about education. We talk about one of my loves, basketball, and how we connect the two and why it's important. And it's one of the reasons I love this podcast so much is because I have the opportunity to like connect on a personal level, make the most personal connections, because I think sometimes we get so focused on education that we can tend to lose the, the bigger picture of like being people and who we are. And this is why I love this podcast so much. I get to really get to sit down and talk to people like I'm having coffee with their friends. So I love this conversation. I hope you enjoyed as well. Thanks for listening to the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos and welcome to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And I'm actually really excited to talk to Ryan Kelleher and I've I've met and talked to Ryan uh, a few times about his book, The Superstar Curriculum, which we're going to talk a little bit about today. And just kind of hearing his journey on education, what he does teaching entrepreneurship right now and some other classes and just really having a, a great conversation. And, and uh, I'm, I'm really blessed. Ryan is a new father uh, and he's made this time, which is like, you know, I, I know because like I'm a pretty new dad uh, for the second time, just like you are as well. So congratulations. Uh, but Ryan, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited for people to uh, learn with you today and actually hear some about your experiences, some of the work that you're doing in education. So if you could just kind of start off, tell us who you are and just tell us a little bit about, you know, your educational experience. Yeah, first of all, I just want to thank you a lot for having me on the podcast. I'm super pumped to have the discussion today, and uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, like you mentioned, my name is Ryan Kelleher, and I am a high school teacher in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island. I'm, uh, this is my 14th year teaching, and I do teach entrepreneurship in grade 11 course and uh, some career exploration courses as well. Um, I am a new father right now. I'm enjoying a couple weeks of parental leave at home. I've got two boys, a two-year-old named Rafa and a two-month-old named Reese, and I'm uh, enjoying my leave, but looking forward to getting back to the classroom. Um, I've always been interested in uh, student development and, and leadership, and, and ever since I started teaching, um, I've really enjoyed the courses that I've taught. I've taught a variety of courses, um, but at the forefront has always been, I've been much more interested in the teenagers that were in the classrooms. And mm -hmm. I've always enjoyed kind of being part of a team in a, in a classroom. Um, so that did prompt me to kind of uh, try and extend my reach into coaching. I, I coached basketball for over a decade. And then in the last few years, I ended up writing um, a book that I thought could maybe help uh, empower teenagers and help them see school as a little bit less of an obligation and, and more of an opportunity. And, and that's when I um, released the Superstar curriculum a few years ago um, that I'm sure we'll probably talk about later on in the podcast. Yeah. Like, you know, everyone knows I'm a huge basketball guy. Anyone who listens to this podcast. So like, wh wh what do you coach? Like, are you, st are you still coaching right now? So now oh, maybe, with, not, uh... maybe not this year. <laughs> I'm a little busy right now, but oh, yeah. uh, so, so I took, I took a little, um, I, I took a little hiatus, but I did coach for over a decade and we, we had a lot of success and I played five years of university basketball and I'm a huge basketball fan. Um, so wait, you, where'd you play basketball? Where'd you play university basketball? Cape Breton University. 
I, I played oh, man, for five we, years. we got to go. We got to, when this is over, man. Okay, I got to, how tall are you? Six, four. What? I, I don't know yeah. why. I, I, this, I, you know, it's actually interesting because like I'm six foot four as well. And I, I like just felt what a lot of people feel when they actually meet me. They're like, oh, I didn't know you were so tall. And I like would have <laughs> never guessed you were six foot four. Okay. Yeah. I actually, I thought you were like, you know, I thought I could, I'm not playing you now. No, I know you're six foot four. I'm not, I'm not taking you. All right. So oh, that backfired. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I'm like, I'm like all over the basketball shoes right now. So like, I'm more into basketball shoes than I'm into basketball right now, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> So yeah, that's, that's, that's really cool. And like, do you, do you actually think that, you know, um, playing high level basketball coaching, uh, like how did, like, just let's not even talk about the coaching right now, but playing in those like basketball. And I have a very personal interest in this. Like, did that actually, do you think that made you a better teacher? Oh, a hundred percent. Um, I think firstly, it made me a better teammate and right. As soon as you're, as soon as you're a good teammate, you have a pretty good chance at, at becoming a good teacher, a good leader in, in the classroom. Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I always say the only thing better than having good teammates is being a good teammate. Or the only good, the only right. thing better than having good friends is being good, uh, being a good friend. And when you are in the classroom, you need to develop those relationships with the people you're around. And once you develop that trust. And, and, and those relationships, then you can learn and, and grow together. So, you know, being part of a university basketball program where um, you're trying to achieve a goal over time mm-hmm. and you need to develop those relationships in order to do so, um, super valuable and super transferable. It's like I, like I, a lot of people, when they listen to this stuff, they're like, what does this have to do with teaching, right? Like I'm here for this education podcast. And I actually think like these outside things that we do, and it's like basketball for you, basketball for me, could be someone listening to something different. You have to kind of stop and take like, how does this actually impact what I do in education? Like I, um, I don't know if you know this about me, but I actually refed uh, really high level basketball for a while. And uh, I, then I started getting into speaking and basically I had to choose, right? Like I had to choose, like, are you going to pursue this basketball career? Um, and actually one of the people I refed with, Literally, his name is Matt Calio. He actually just, he's the first uh, Canadian NBA referee just started this year. I don't know if you know that. Wow. Yeah. And he's from Edmonton. He's from Edmonton, but being a referee made me so much better of an administrator because like, like if a, let's say a parent was upset about something, well, they weren't upset at me out of breath. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Like I had people screaming and yelling at me, right. Like all the time, like, and you you know, this with a referee, you're wrong 50% of the time to like 50% of the people in the room. Right. But right. just, just actually like some of the vulnerability. I remember, um, this one time I was refing, uh, I was refing basketball and it was like a, it was like a college game and we did three person refing, right? So like there's, there's usually at like high school level, it's two person. I don't know if it's the same in, you know, yeah. Cape Breton. And then, you know, you go to the higher levels of three person cause there's more stuff going on and that's just kind of how they set it up. And I'm fairly new to three person refing and I, I actually, um, wasn't getting like, there's no, I didn't make one call in the first quarter. I remember this so distinctly. And I'm like, am I like out of it? Cause you have people watching you at that level, right? They're like evaluating oh, yeah. you. And the last thing you want to say is like, Hey, you missed this. You missed this. You missed this. So there is one call that I made and this guy, it was just like the worst foul call ever, but I was just like, felt like I had to make something and I just blew my whistle out of nowhere. And the coach was just yelling at me like just started screaming at me and i'm like coach i'll talk to you when there's like a dead ball i'll never forget this and like my partners at the time they didn't want to say like that was a terrible call but i remember them saying like don't go over there because they're like you're gonna get it and you're gonna deserve it like that's basically what they're saying it and uh and I said, no, I'm good. I'm good. So, so I said, next dead ball. So what does he do? He calls a timeout so he can like, you know, rip me apart for this terrible call I made. And then I just, so he calls a timeout and then I just walked over there. I said, coach, there's no need to discuss that call. It was terrible. I don't know what I was doing. I will not do that again. My bad. And he's like, and he just kind of like, all right, 
And then you never said anything. Cause like, what are you, what are you going to do? Yeah, it was bad. Yeah, I know. It was, I, I just told you it was bad. And that like little lesson for me is like, Hey, it's way better to actually like, like say like, Hey, I screw this up and I'm going to fix it. than it is for someone else to tell you that. Right. Definitely. And like those little I, things that you learn, right? Like those little things you learn in these, you know, outside things that actually apply really well to education. Yeah. And I, I ref for one year, one year only. <laughs> and, <laughs> right. uh, <laughs> And, but, but you're so right. Like mm -hmm. even, you know, when you make that judgment call in a, in a second, yeah. you, you have to have the willingness to do it. But then secondly, you sometimes have to have the willingness to say, you know what? Yeah. I messed that one up. Yeah. I realize that I'm going to get the next one and, and, and move on. Yeah. And the, and people respect you for that. Right. Cause the, the, yeah. the, some people there's a insecurity level where they know they screwed up, they won't admit it. And it only makes things actually worse. Whereas if you admit it, like no player was mad at me, uh, no coach was mad at me after that, just because I'm like, yeah, oh, oh, that was bad, right? And I'm like, hey, you miss layups, I'm not getting up, I'm not getting on you too. Like those are easy ones too, right? Like we all screw up in little ways. And so like, if we can own up for it and yeah, it, it's uh, I, like, I remember that, it's, it's cool. I, did, I actually did not know that about you. I didn't know you play basketball, so. Yeah, we yeah, we're good. going, man. Were you a three point shooter? Like you shoot threes? Yeah, I was a point guard. Yeah, we had a great run. We lost in the national semifinals in my fourth year. We lost to Carleton University. And Carleton isn't Carleton like win every year? Is that the school? They, they seem to win almost every <laughs> year. Yeah, they've got quite. That's a awesome, man. That's cool. We're gonna I actually somebody just invited me on to like do like an education basketball podcast, and it can be like two seconds to respond. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want to talk basketball? I could do that all day. Okay. So let's, yeah. let's get, you know, like we connected that to education. So, um, what you're teaching, how long have you been teaching for Ryan? Like how long have you been in this education? Is my, this is my 14th year. 14th year. So did, did actually like, did an entrepreneurship class exist when you first started teaching? So it didn't exist. I don't think when I first started, but it did exist while I was still teaching some other courses. Yeah. Um, and then I went back to school in the evenings and I did my MBA um, yeah. in 2011. And when I finished my master's of business, um, I kind of asked to take over the entrepreneurship course. And uh, so I've been teaching it since 2013. And uh, since then, it's grown into a, uh, a pretty interesting course in school that um, we've grown in sections of it. And what what's uh, kind of neat about the course is that students actually um, come into the course and they invest their own money and they start up their own company and they run it for a series of weeks from ideation right up mm -hmm. to marketing, right up to um, sales. And then they really? um, close the company down, distribute profits to shareholders and basically run through the whole business process um, in a matter of, of a couple months. So. Okay. So I got to ask you this and this is going to be someone, someone's going to wonder this too, listening to this. So what, like you're telling me that students actually invest their own money in this process. So what, yeah, about, so that, that, that's, that's something that happens there. Yeah. So oh, we, so we partner with junior achievement PEI okay. uh, and uh, the, they can invest up to a maximum of $20. Uh, oh, okay. Is, okay. Is, is the most a, per, a person can invest. So if there's six people in a company, um, they can invest $120 or they can That's get right. outside investors as well, but no one can invest more than $20 individually um, sure. per person. And, uh, and then of course, you know, if there are situations where a student um, is struggling to find the, right. the money to invest, the, the, the junior achievement or, or the school comes mm -hmm. in at, at that point to make sure it's equitable and accessible Good. to everybody. Yeah. Cause I, you know, I think there's a, you know, that's one thing is that it, it's a lot easier to actually, Make money when you start with money, right? Yeah. And I think part of that too is that you have to make sure that that experience, because like listening to that, and I'm, I'm going to ask you more about it. Like you talk about like the whole notion of like preparing kids to the real world is not really valid because they already live in a real world. You know, it's kind of like, like, you know, when you're 18, then it becomes real all of a sudden. It's a very real thing that we live in and creating like, there's a, there's a, there's, there's a difference between for me, creating relevant experiences versus real experiences, right? And what you're right. doing is creating a real experience. So like, like what's something that maybe has been created from that class? Like what's something that you saw students do? What was like a, like a success story that you have? Um, we've had 
there's been there's been lots of success stories. I'm trying to think of one that a, a recent one that I thought was kind of neat was a group of guys actually they got mm-hmm. together and uh, and they had a connection with um, a radio station uh, in PEI and they decided that they were going to make candles and so they made homemade candles but they decided that they were going to give half of their profits to uh, Toys for Tots, which is a, a fundraiser mm-hmm. come, comes around Christmas time. And uh, they used their connection with the radio station to advertise this. And they ended up, I forget how many thousands of candles they sold, but they ended up making a few thousand dollars for themselves and raising a few thousand wow. dollars for Toys for Tots and uh, had quite a name for themselves. And, and I remember after the holidays um when we were talking about everybody's holiday um some of the guys said you know the best part of christmas was actually waking up christmas morning right thinking that all those toys that we were able to buy for kids who you know they don't know who opened them but uh, they had that feeling of of contributing to society through entrepreneurship so it was it was a really cool experience for them I, and I appreciate you sharing that because I think sometimes when people look at entrepreneurship, it's like, it's all about, you know, greed, but I think sometimes it's, it's really about finding ways that you can, you know, you can make a living, do certain things, but also helping. Now there is obviously examples of where it's just pure greed and things like that, but really sure. learning how to like, you know, give to others and, you know, you take care of people in need is, you know, I, I, that's a really important part of that story. So I love that you share that. And when you're looking at this class, have you had any students who have, and I got to ask you this first, like what, what actually made you want to get an MBA? Like there's a point actually, I bet you this is somewhere that I was like, Hey, like would an MBA apply to, for example, being an administrator? Cause when I was a principal, I had to like do budgets and things like that. And you know, like, uh, there, there is like this whole, uh, I've always challenged this, the whole like, oh, we don't need managers, we need leaders. No, you need both because you can't actually lead anything if you can't get resources in the hands of teachers. Like part right. of it too is like you see uh, schools where teachers are paying for supplies and things like that. And I'm like, why is that even happening, right? Like we used to, this is going to shock some people because I know a lot of people, um, you know, worldwide listen to this. We gave our teachers credit cards uh, and they could directly, so I saw your face when you did this, <laughs> they were directly tied to the school budget. Now they had like a right. limit. It wasn't like, you know, they could just buy like a Louis Vuitton bag or like expensive pair of Jordans or things like that. Like they yeah. had to like validate, but they had like a limit that they could just, you know, if they needed something for the classroom, they didn't have to like ask my permission. They just right. paid for it. And, you know, like, I don't think, you know, in the several years that there's a process when I was an administrator, uh, I don't think I, it's like, Hey, like, make sure you're buying stuff that has to do with school. Right. Right. But I saw everything. I had to like sign everyone's statement and go through it. And I can't remember one time that a teacher took advantage of it. Yeah. It's like, once you, once you give, you know, anyone some responsibility, you, 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 usually they'll rise to that level, right? So right, no nobody wanted to be the reason that the credit cards were taken away, right? <laughs> right, because that would be cool. not a that would not be not a good thing. But like that that is uh yeah like I like that that is like the there is a business aspect of education because you Very do nice. have to like say how do you put resources in the hands of the people that are working closest with children. So like, Mm -hmm. so like when you're in this journey, you know, as an educator, like what, what made you like, were you getting an MBA to like get out of education? Like, was it connected? Like what, how did you see this? Yeah, no, it was still connected. I think it was just my interest in business and education. So I actually, in university, my first two years, I took business, um, but the university um, where I wanted to go from education degree didn't take business as a teachable. So I had to switch out to an arts degree. Um, So when I finished my arts degree, I still had a keen interest in business. So when I, um, when the opportunity arose, once I was already teaching to take an MBA and just pursue my interest in in business education, I I decided to do so. Um, And all that being said too, I've always been personally interested and fascinated with ideas and change and innovation, much like you. And, and, 
And uh, I thought that a program like that would be um, enlightening to to hear about, you know, the way industries change, the way businesses change, um, the way that uh, the way that um, people can take aspects of certain organizations and, and transplant them into other places. And, and, right. and that happens all the time in, in business and education. So I, it's definitely been applicable. Well, and then, like when you're, yeah. And I, I think that's a really important point because uh, one of the, the characteristics of the innovators mindset that I talk about is the notion of being observant. And what I mean by that is really, can you look at things that are happening outside of education, understand them, think about how can I actually make this apply? So like a really simple example is uh, Google used to do this thing. And this is more, I don't know if it's like how true it is or how accurate, but the description is that they do this 20% time. And so it was like, like uh, they actually, employees had 20% of their time to actually go pursue interests of like their own, you know, but the really the 20% time was like, it had to be something that advanced Google. So it wasn't like you could just do whatever you want at 20% time. It actually had to be something beneficial. And so like, from what I know, things like Gmail were created from 20% time, right. By, you know, people in the company, but someone sees that likes the idea and then starts things like genius hour. Right. And they make something similar to that. And it's like, Hey, here's an idea um, that really applies to education um, that I can make and tweak it to education. What I would love to see at some point is that the stuff that we do in education, businesses look at and say like, hey, you know, here's something that schools are really good at. Uh, They can actually do quite a bit with not that much money. Like that's a skill we should be learning, right? Because some places have like, you know, not unlimited amount of budgets, but huge. And, and schools are, have to be very thoughtful of how they spend their money. Um, you can't just spend it on whatever. And, and so like, there's a lot of stuff that, uh, like even like one of the most important skills in any business is actually having people that have the ability to constantly learn. Like where, right. where could you, you know, is there, is there any place where we could learn that from? <laughs> right? Like schools could teach those lessons. Right. So like, it's, it's, it's kind of connected. Well, exactly. I mean, even you look at business and education, like you can use the example of, for instance, Blockbuster and how, you know, their failure to adapt and innovate over time, you know, they eventually um, end up with a model that that just doesn't work. And in education, um, there may be some classrooms that are very much still on the Blockbuster model where everyone else is moving on to Netflix and, and, right. you know, it's just, it's just having that self-awareness um, to see what's out there and then try and figure out how you can change and, and, and change yourself by, by applying kind of new techniques, new strategies um, from something that's already working. Yeah. And like if you're, if you're listening to this and any of you do any investing, the, one of the things that is really key is like, don't invest in a company because you like their product invest in a company that you see that iterates and grows, right? Like right. Uh, one of the things with Amazon is they have like a, an idea of like, it's, it's, they're always on what's called day one. So day one is like, they have to be like, always start a new, start creating stuff, right? So they're making sure that's relevant. And I, I actually was just having this conversation about like the idea of people learn so much from Blockbuster that if you don't adapt, so companies are really thoughtful of this, that, you know, like even um, in their acquisitions, like Lululemon just bought uh, that company with the mirror where you actually exercise. Um, So there's like a mirror. Have you seen this before? It's kind of neat. So like, it's basically like a mirror. It's like a full body mirror and you just put it up and it's like a, it's like a mirror TV and you can like do workouts in front of that mirror. Right. So part of it too, is like, it's not just a mirror. You have to buy the subscription to, to actually like, so like you might, you might have a one-time payment for the mirror, but it's like, they have you connected the entire time, right. Through this. So this is a startup company. Lululemon starts doing this because they're saying like, Hey, we got to like grow. And it's actually the first acquisition that Lululemon had and i think part of that too is that ability to kind of grow and develop is something that is really important for educators like the question i like used to ask educators all the time is like what would we look back 10 years from now and say like i can't believe we used to do that right exactly right and so like we have to be 
in that process as well. Like, you know, we don't want to have that, that, that blockbuster where we're just kind of like one thing we're adapting. And so when you, when you're talking about this, so you said you started ta- teaching the entrepreneurship class, what, 2013? Is that when? Yeah. So like yeah. how, so like in eight years and maybe even right now during, uh, a, you know, pandemic, like what changes have you seen in that class? Maybe even the opportunities that students have, like in the times that you've been teaching it, because it probably wasn't your day one probably is different from, you know, the last time you were there. Definitely. I, w- I would say the more recent years, um, the student's ability to market via social media mm-hmm. um, is just so much that they're, they're experts right. <laughs> com- com- compared to even, even eight years ago. Um, so their ability to get their message out there in, in unique and creative ways and, and try and, um, try and really target a specific market in, in a way that they know how, um, is, uh, is quite impressive. So, you know, I teach them about marketing, but then I usually, uh, sorry about promotion and, and then, and I'll usually sit back and, and watch them, um, kind of in their natural domain, just executing what whatever they're trying to do on on media well what's here's something that i've seen in education that i find is fascinating because there's sometimes we're doing the opposite like uh, a lot of people were like talking about your brand and it was like they're becoming more like businesses but what i actually saw from like a lot of like businesses they were trying to become more personal right. right so like for example i'm on tiktok and i like i love i actually follow a ton of like uh, like NFL teams, NBA teams, and they do so many like really personal, funny things. And like someone will comment like, Hey, does the Detroit lions, uh, do the Detroit lions, uh, reply? And they like reply. And now you like, and now the Detroit lions, uh, is almost taking on the personality of the person running the social media account. It's kind of like, like one of the funny things about like the Wendy's Twitter account is that it like roasts people and it's like kind of known for that. Yeah. Whereas you're like, Oh, that, that hamburger place. Right. Like it's, but they make it really personal. Right. And there is like a, there is like a really kind of neat ability to do that where sometimes where I've seen schools go is they are like, you know, here's information, here's this information. It's like the people don't connect with that. Like they, they're the, a lot of places, what they've done is they've created these accounts for their businesses that are emulate more personal characteristics. Whereas sometimes yeah. we pull that personality away in the way that we share in social media. It, yeah. And it, you could use that example in, in the classroom too, mm-hmm. you know, where you're trying to create the brand, so to speak of your classroom. And you, you, you know, every company has those brand pillars that they, that they want to yeah. um, be consistent with in their messaging. And, you know, w- what are those three words that, that students are going to think about when they, when they think about your course. And, and then every day it's about trying to deliver on, on those three right. keywords, whatever, whatever they might be. Have you, have you had like any students who have, um, pursued the work that you've done in that class and then maybe not gone to like college because they're doing stuff from your class or like, you know, have just seen that or you typically, you know, have they gone in different directions than maybe what you and I had access to? Cause like when I was a kid, it was like going to university or college was not even an option for my parents. It was like, you're going. Like right. that, that's it. This is the only way to them. Right. Whereas I see yeah. there's much more opportunity, uh, for our kids than there was for me. Right. And it's, a lot of things have opened up. Yeah. I, I haven't seen anybody make just the, the, the pure leap into just yeah. the world of entrepreneurship, but it, it definitely does, um, open up their eyes to the opportunities that, right. that do exist. Um, a lot of them do end up still, you know, pursuing a uh, business education in post-secondary, whether it's college, college or university. Um, but I think it definitely um, having a course like that, where it is kind of a uh, real world experience, it, it definitely shows them what is possible with entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. And, and it may, it may just kind of um, add a little more fuel to the fire, but it, it doesn't, I, I, it hasn't made anybody totally leap out. Right. And, and try something solo yet no well i'm sure at some point right and then you, you know maybe they'll kind of cut you in <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly 
<laughs> hey, so let's uh, let's talk about so your book, Superstar Curriculum, right? This is actually yeah. the the difference in this book. It's not I, like from what I remember, it's not actually meant for educators as much as it is for students. Correct. Correct. So tell tell me tell us about the book. What what is the book? What's what's the hope for it? Like what what's the message you're trying to get out? Like what what is the Superstar Curriculum? So the Superstar Curriculum is basically a collection of skills, habits, and attitudes that I have found myself as a teacher um, discussing most with students over 14 years. So when I think back to the most meaningful conversations I've ever had with students, very rarely did they ever have to do with course content. Mm -hmm. Um, And most often did they have to do with um, everyday success principles. So the the superstar curriculum is um, built into four components character development, uh, habit of mind development, opportunity development, and personal leadership. And what I do is I take those important conversations I've, I've had, and I try and show students that all of these great qualities, um, they can be developed in school, mm-hmm. um, even though they may not be explicitly taught. Mm-hmm. And have you, you've seen, like you, like when I talk to you, you've seen schools use this with their students, correct? Yeah. So like, what are some of the ways that a school would actually like use this book? Like how are, what are they doing with this? So it's been used in a variety of ways. So, um, there are courses like in Alberta, um, Mm -hmm. I think you guys, you guys have a calm course. Yeah. Yeah. Career and career and life management. Right. So, so it's been used in career and life management courses just as, uh, so the way, the way the book's set up, it's 28 chapters. They're four pages or less. Um, yeah. They take about 10 minutes and there's a self-awareness reflection opportunity at the end of each chapter. So, so some schools use it as a full class activity, mm-hmm. um, whereas other schools um, use it in their guidance department. Um, and other schools just kind of have, have it as a library resource. And then, uh, and then there's, uh, there's some schools in Ontario uh, who use the book with their student leadership teams right. as well, or, or, or in their leadership courses. Yeah. And I, I, like, I think, so, you know, talking about, uh, like superstar curriculum, talking about innovators mindset, and I talk about these characteristics, right. And one of the things that I find really fascinating is sometimes, uh, people say, well, like how, like you don't like, what does like reflection, how does that prove to like, actually be beneficial for like learning and when when i when they say that i think they they're not talking about learning they're talking about to their grades right Right. which is like okay like i actually understand that you know we have certain constraints we have certain expectations that we have as schools and every school has different accountability measures things like that but if you teach you know like the ability to reflect if you teach resiliency to students, right? And like a lot, of, a lot of students have, you know, a lot of people deal with, you know, are resilient before they even show up to school. And we understand that, but it doesn't mean more things are going to come their way that they have to deal with. And how do you actually deal with things? Like we talk a lot about failure in schools, but we don't talk enough about how do we get up, right? Exactly. So, so yeah, like I'm not going to say to you like, hey, this one characteristic is going to give you five bonus points on math, right? It's going to actually help people to be able to better deal with the world. Like if you develop, like if you become a resilient person, like I'm not promising you, it's going to, you know, make you a better essay writer, but it's, it's going to be beneficial to your life overall. Well, exactly. And a lot of these qualities and habits that, that I talk about in the book, but Mm -hmm. you know, none of them, none of them are rocket science, Um, but, but all of them, are super valuable in, in their own right. Mm-hmm. And what I've found fr- from this book is that mm-hmm. kind of two things have happened um, with readers. They love to read about all the things that they do rip super well. And, you know, it, ma- it makes right. them feel really good about themselves and it empowers them, which is great. And then, and then they also get to reflect on some things that, you know what, here's, here's an area for uh, opportunity for growth for me. And I already do all these things really well. So I can go and do this really well too. So, you know, when I was writing it, I was always picturing somebody reading it and saying, oh yeah, this is what I need to improve. Whereas just as importantly, it's, it's 
great to reinforce the great qualities that people already have. Yeah. And like when you're, when this book, like, so for teachers that are listening, someone might be interested in like, Hey, I want to do this with my students. Is this for elementary kids, high school? Like where, where is it typically utilized? Yeah. So this is anyone from grade seven to, I would say 12, but, but, but even in the university, I kind of wrote it with the 15, 16 year old in mind, just cause that's the level yeah. where, where I teach. Um, but that was the level I was most, might- that was the level I was most horrible as a human being. <laughs> <laughs> probably could but, but, probably uh, could have used that when I was in school. <laughs> well, I, I did, I did try and write the book that I kind of wished I had. like, <laughs> I was, a, I was a reluctant reader right. um, in school. And so, you know, I tried to write it um, with short chapters for, for those reluctant readers. I tried to make the chapters, they all stand alone. So, you know, you can jump from chapter to chapter um you know chapter two to chapter 26 and then back to 14 um and i tried to make it with the word choice um i tried to make it in a way that treated teenagers as young adults as opposed to um some of the nonfiction that i think that is out there for teens treats teens like kids right. and i tried to do the, the the reverse with that um, yeah. it, and just as another way to try and empower them and, and, and see themselves as where they want to be. Like, I, like I was, it's weird that you're saying this. Cause I was like having, um, like a little dad internal struggle today. Cause I actually will not like play, uh, I don't play like little kid music for my daughters. I play right. like, yeah. So, uh, this morning I was working out and, uh, blinding lights, by the weekend was playing when I was working out and my daughter like ran downstairs and I just, she was dancing and she loves that song and she's four. Right. right? And so I'm like, what? So like, I, I'm like scared that someone's going to put this in the comments. I'm like, so I really started listening to the lyrics. I'm like, cause you know, sometimes like lyrics are like really hor You sing them all the time, but then you actually like yeah. listen to them. You're like, Oh, that's what that's talking about. So I'm like, what, what is that? What is actually this story? Like, I, and I actually don't even want to know now. So like, if you know, and it's horrible, please do not put it in the comments. Right. Cause I was just thinking about that. And then I was like, Oh, should I, should I like, you know, be, should I be like playing like Raffi and like kid stuff. Right. And yeah. having that, but she like loves that stuff. And it's some of it too. Like I, I posted a picture of Kalia and, uh, she has, I bought what I wanted as a kid. I bought, I don't know if you saw this on Instagram today. I bought, a WWE championship belt. And the reason oh, I bought okay. it is because her and I, like during the pandemic, I got her playing PlayStation. Cause I was like, I can't watch kid movies. I just can't do it. And she like, wasn't very good. She's getting good. Uh, she beat me the other night. So she, so I brought, I'm like you in the title and I actually gave her a physical title and it's like, she slept on her bed and you know, it's kind of like, like part of it too, is that she knows I love it. So there's a connection, but I'm like, you know, maybe I should get her doing more kid stuff. Like maybe, you know, Hulk Hogan and uh, Macho Man fighting each other is probably not the, maybe not the best thing. So I always like kind of struggle <laughs> with that. Right. Like, like, yeah. what, like, what do you think? Cause it's kind of like, Hey, I want kids to have a childhood, but like a lot of my childhood was like listening to Depeche Mode because I had older brothers. Do you know what I mean? Like, which is like probably not a good thing to listen to Depeche Mode when you're five, but no, I, I no. you know, but but I but I think the root of what you're saying though is 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 a, is very much along the same lines in the sense that um, there's nothing wrong there's nothing wrong with um, having a level of maturity to right. um, whether it's you know even if the music you were listening to if you if the lyrics weren't <laughs> maybe what right. what you thought they were. Right you you could still always backtrack and have a conversation about that mm-hmm. um you know um but to just say well i must only listen to the wiggles right. or or or, or right. raffi or or whatever the case may be um you know eventually you're going to you're going to move on hey, so raffi I, I, actually connected with me on twitter once so shout out to raffi <laughs> oh, yeah. so i don't want to no, no there's no dissing to raffi so just just i want everyone yeah. to be clear i don't want it I want a Rafi hate because I like Rafi. <laughs> well, my son's name is Rafa, actually. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's actually so sometimes I'm like uh, in bed and, and Clea will go come up there and it's kind of funny because we play WWE 
and she'll just like stand up on my bed and she'll just like off the top rope and she'll just elbow me and it's the funniest thing ever right i'm like i just as long as she doesn't do that to a kid i'm good she does it to me yeah. you know it's kind of funny so those hey belts, yeah those belts so were, were so awesome when i was in elementary school like you would just show up with a, <laughs> with a belt on oh man well we actually like i remember there was like a commercial right um when I was a kid and we used to watch wrestling Saturday mornings and it was like totally different wrestling. And I'm like still obsessed with that era, like that, you know, macho man, like Hulk Hogan. Like I can remember like Paul Orndorff uh, turning on Hulk Hogan on Saturday morning wrestling. And I was like the, one of the, my favorite moments ever in life, <laughs> like not just in wrestling. I was just like, just so, cause I, I wasn't a big Hulk Hogan fan. And, yeah. and I remember they had that belt, but I lived in like Humboldt, Saskatchewan. There's no internet. And I'm like, ah, like I want that so bad, but like, where am I? Like, I'm like, there's no store where I live that's getting that. And if you go yeah. like, by the time I get to the city, it's going to be sold out. Right. And I was just like, you know, walking in Walmart, uh, picking up some stuff. And there was like, they had like all, they had like 18 different versions of belts. I'm like, oh, this is like awesome. And then, so I just, <laughs> so I think I was like more excited to get it than I thought she would be, but she was pumped and she's like putting it over her shoulder and like hanging on her bed. So it was, it's kind of neat. So kind of yeah. neat to see. Hey, um, so anyone that's interested, check out in the links, uh, in the description, you'll actually see a link to uh, the superstar curriculum. Uh, you'll see Ryan's uh, social media contact there too. So like, if you have any questions, if you're interested in uh, implementing this in any way, just make sure you connect with Ryan, check out the link below as well. Um, I'm going to ask you this because I didn't know you're a big basketball guy. I did not know this. So like, yeah. who is the, who is like the best is there like you played at university level? You played a really who was the best basketball player you ever played against? Like, do you got like a is there like an NBA player you played against? It's funny you say that because just two nights ago, guy from Nova Raptors, Scotia, right? Guy from Nova Scotia. So I got to give a big shout out to Nate Darling. Um, I, 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 yeah. So I, I I I played against him a few times. I played with him a few times, and he's a tremendous young talent uh, with a bright future ahead. So. Um, big proud moment for Atlanta, Canada and for Nova Scotia in particular, and, uh, definitely for him and his family. That's pretty cool. So I actually won, uh, I was refing a high school tournament in Edmonton. It's a pretty big tournament. And, uh, there's this guy who's tall kid who's very good. And he got in foul. Like I called like three fouls on him in the first half. Right. And they were like obvious fouls. And, uh, Someone comes out to me in the stands at halftime. They're like, don't you call that you, my son? Do you know who this like kid, like my kid's going to be in the NBA? And I'm like, if your kid's going to be in the NBA, you got to stay out of foul trouble. Like, <laughs> right? Like th this is like, you know, like tell him not to foul. And right. I was like, I'm not listening to you, right? And like, if I'm being honest, like I remember this particular because a lot of parents think their kid is going to the NBA. Well, that was actually Kelly Olynyk's dad. <laughs> So Kelly oh, Linux wow. played for the Heat, got drafted by the Celtics. And uh, yeah, like yeah. I know people that actually, you know, work. So I was like, okay, I, mean, I guess he was. But hey, I, yeah. you know, <laughs> but I kept him out of a game, right? Like I kept him out of a game for probably 10 minutes and a half because he's in foul trouble. <laughs> so it's kind of, who who's your, did you have like an NBA team when you were growing up? Yeah, I mean, I was, uh, I grew up in the Michael Jordan era. So I was a Bulls fan growing up, but then I was a Steve Nash. Um, yeah super fan like if, if you go to my instagram and and you go I, I i made a post of the way i looked in university versus the way steve oh. nash looked <laughs> <laughs> did you have a floppy and, hair uh, is that you're telling me imitation was definitely a form right of, uh, that's hilarious <laughs> yeah that that's a like i was a big lakers fan i i actually um it's interesting because i have like in my house right now i have like people have been bugging me because I have like a little bit of a shoe fetish. Like I'm like really into basketball shoes and I'm like, especially into like Jordan ones, which, okay. which, and like, they're just really cool. I love them. Uh, they're just neat. And they, they're, they're kind of interesting because they tell like the way that they're um, selling shoes. It's not like, Hey, this is a cool shoe. It's like, Hey, this is like the Michael Jordan shoe from like this night. And there's like a story to it. And so like, when oh, you know the story yeah. behind it, it's really cool. Like, uh, one of the shoes I just saw that was really cool is there's like a, there's a very, um, like the first Air Jordan, uh, like the red and white, and you could probably like picture it, right? And then, 
and it's like meshed with like uh, Spider Man, and so there's like it's like it's there's like a little bit of like uh, like black dots on there, and then there's right. like a blue, and you can kind of see the, how they connect, and it's like that's like like my dream shoe, and it's kind of neat because it's not just like hey, this looks really cool. There's kind of like a connection to these like things and all all, all this stuff, and why it's funny that you say you're a Bulls fan. I hated Michael Jordan. I hated the Bulls. And the reason I hated them is because you couldn't beat them. They were impossible. And yeah. then, and then, and then when, and then when he retired, it was like the NBA is super boring. Like, I just, I'm not interested in it. Like, cause, because it was like the whole thing that I loved was actually trying to see people beat Jordan because it was like such a, like, it was like that actually kept me. So I watched him all the time. And so when he came back, I loved him. And it was like interesting because you don't necessarily appreciate it. Like a lot of the players I hate as a kid, like I really re- admire and respect now, like Larry Bird, I was not a fan of. Larry Bird signed an autograph for me. I actually met Larry Bird on my 40th birthday and he signed an autograph for me. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, Mr. Bird, you're like one of my favorite players, which was a total lie because I hated him <laughs> as a kid because I was a Magic Johnson guy. But like in the moment, and he was like, and I said, this is such an incredible honor to meet you on, on my birthday. And he's like, happy birthday. And I just felt like, I just about died. Like it was so cool, right? Like just yeah, to see that. that. Incredible. Yeah, and you just like you you appreciate. And I think a lot of times we take for granted. Um, and like I, this is not just in you know sports world. We take for granted people that really make an impact on our lives. You take a uh, granted greatness in those things, right? And so, like it's kind of so neat true. that you like Jordan. But I like one one time when we're uh, kind of awful because I don't think anyone cares. I'll show you all my Jordans. <laughs> I got a lot. I got a lot of Jordans, right? I got. People are like, you got a shoe problem. I'm like, there's better problems to have. Like, there's worse oh, problems. Yeah. There's worse problems I could have. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, some of the shoe collaborations that are coming out now, they're just, like, just yeah, just amazing. So, yeah, I can I can see why you would have the the interest for sure. It is like the it is the worst. Like trying to get a shoe. Like uh, there's a Kobe shoe that was available yesterday, sold out in 30 seconds. And like, it's impossible and just, and it's like, oh, yeah. it's like, and people, and it's like sad because people buy them to sell them. Whereas I like, yeah, I yeah. want to actually wear them. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So I didn't know that we'll have to, we'll have to chat basketball one time. Right. I was going to challenge Definitely. you, but then, you know, no, that's not happening anymore. Oh, uh, <laughs> you, you get someone, I'll ref it. How about that? That would probably be better. Very good. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'll, I'll chat basketball anytime. <laughs> right. Cause I was, I was actually six foot four and I pretended I was a guard, but I was like the tallest guy on my team. So it was like, Quit bringing up the ball, right? So I, I was like a, a Charles Barkley type when I was a kid, right? <laughs> so a little bit shorter, but, you know, could still jump. But Hey, anyways, yeah. make sure, uh, Ryan, thanks so much for being on the podcast. And uh, anyone listening, I really encourage you to check out Ryan's uh, book. And, and really awesome to think about how incredible this is to, like, have an opportunity to, uh, you know, do this with your students as opposed to, like, reading something to, like, you know, learn strategies. I think that that's part of it. It's not like... It's not like it's not educators can't read it too. It's something you can do with your students, right? Not something just for your students that you kind of step back with, right? Yeah. Ex- oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's it's very transferable in the sense that, you know, I learned when I was writing it, yeah. I became, I, I know I became a better teacher um, yes. when I was writing it because like, like we were talking about earlier, so many times I was putting myself in the student's shoes yeah. and um, just by going through that, um, it definitely changed the way I, I interacted and, and carried myself in the classroom. Love it. Love it. So, Hey, everyone, thanks for listening. Ryan, check out, uh, make sure you follow Ryan on, and maybe you can see, I'll post your Instagram and we can see your floppy hair, your Steve Nash hair. So, Hey, yeah. Ryan, thanks for being on everyone. Thanks for listening. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Take care.